The previous video in the playlist introduced the notion of a queue and what we can see here is a queue of jobs that are going to be executed by the operating system when it's their turn and we say that these jobs are in what's referred to as the hold state. Based on an appropriate operating system policy one of the jobs will actually be admitted into the ready state. Now it's the job scheduler that's responsible for admitting a particular job to the ready state. Of course from the last video you will be aware that we have a ready to run queue and this queue consists of a number of process control blocks to which we add another for the one we've just transferred from the hold to the ready state and of course these process control blocks are data structures they're not machine code they hold information about an individual process. Now one of the processes as represented by these process control blocks will actually be selected and executed and we say that this is being dispatched to the running state and this dispatching is actually controlled by something called the process scheduler. Now when a process is dispatched to the running state what we're actually saying we're saying that the process is allocated CPU time, i.e. it's allocated the resource of the central processing unit. Now this allocation is based on operating system policies. In other words, you look at the queue and you can say, right, well, the first one that entered the queue is the one that I'm going to execute next. And this is called the first come, first serve. But of course, there are other policies about which one should be dispatched before other processes that are actually on the queue as represented by the queue of process control blocks. I'm not suggesting this is the only one, but this is one of the policies. Of course, the running state actually means we're fetching, decoding and executing the machine code of the process, as we can see by these rotating arrows here. That's a, simply a representation of the fetch, decode, execute taking place. Of course, while in the running state, it's feasible that the actual process could have completed as represented by these stationary arrows. In other words, we are no longer fetching and decoding the machine code associated with that particular process. And what we will have, we will have the job being released and it goes to the finished state. And this is controlled by the job scheduler. Now the job schedule will have some responsibilities. For example, it'll get rid of the process control block associated with the releasing of the actual job because when the job is completed, that's what we need to do. We should also note, however, that it is possible to have the process released if an error occurs during the execution. Of course, when a process is in the running state, one of the outcomes is as shown here, it can be released and finished. However, there's other things that can happen to a process when it's in a running state. And what we have, we have a situation where the process can be preempted. Now what this means is the process is removed from the CPU. In other words, it doesn't get the resources of the CPU. It's moved back to the ready state. Now the reason for this is that the operating system might have a time slice allocation policy. Now what that means, a process is put into the running state for a certain length of time, so many fractions of a second for example. And as soon as that time for that particular process is up, the operating system will say, well you've had your time slice, now move back to the ready state. So that's one of the possibilities that will cause the running state to simply stop, which means have the central processing unit removed as a resource from that particular process. We've already seen that it can be finished, but this is another way in which we can have the running state altered to a different state, and in this case, the ready state. Other things that can happen is we might have a higher priority process being ready. In other words, in the ready state, a process has just arrived that's important, very important, so it's given a very high priority. So whatever is currently running will have a lower priority and the operating system will say, well, I'm sorry, you just finished that machine code instruction you're doing and as soon as you finish that, I'm going to preempt you, move you back to the ready state so this other process can run because it's got a higher priority than you. Now, when a process is in a running state, we've just seen it can be preempted and we've also seen that the actual process could finish its execution and in which case it's released to the finish state. 
However, other things can happen to a process when it's in a running state. And what we can find happening is the operating system will move the process from the running state to the waiting state. Now, the reason for this, the process requires some resources that are not immediately available. Now, one example of this is an input output request needs to be serviced. Now, what this means is the process is happily fetching, decoding and executing the machine code instructions that it's actually fetching from the random access memory. But then it comes to a machine code instruction which says, right, I need some data and the data's on the disk. Now, of course, disk access in computing terms is a lot slower than the fetch, decode, execute of instructions. So the operating system will say, well, I'm not hanging around while you're going to the disk to get that data. I'm going to move you to the waiting state to free up the central processing unit so another process can run instead of you. So that's why we can move the process from the running state to the waiting state. Now, the question you might want to ask yourself here, why is it not moved back to the ready state? Well, because it isn't ready, because it's having to wait for the data to be brought in from the actual disk. Now, another reason why a process would be moved from the running state to the waiting state is a page fault has occurred, so the operating system has to swap between the disk and memory. Now, what does this mean? Well, the RAM might not be big enough to store a very large program. So what the operating system does in these circumstances, it loads some of the machine code for that program into its random access memory, because remember, it's from RAM that machine code is fetched, decoded, and executed. So let's say now we're happily going through the machine code instructions. We come to an instruction, we finish it, and then the program counter says, we'll go to the next instruction, only to find it's not in the random access memory. Where is it? It's on the disk. So what the operating system does in those circumstances, it goes and finds the next block of code that's on the disk and moves it into the random access memory. Now that process might also involve moving something out of the random access memory to allow room for the machine code to be brought in. And of course, this is taken care of by one of the other operating system managers. But what the process manager has to do under these circumstances is to say, well, I'm not waiting while you go and get that machine code program. I'll move you to the waiting state to allow another process to actually execute. So the same reason why we move from the running state to the waiting state is because we want to free up the central processing time for other processes. We're trying to hear to make the operating systems more efficient. So we don't waste time hanging around for events that we have to wait for. Now, we've got the process in the waiting state. What happens now? Well, while it's in this waiting state, it's not doing anything. It's just waiting there. Now, the CPU is being used and it's running another process, but we're not talking about that other process. We're talking about the process that's just been moved from the running state. So what happens? Well, it's moved to the ready state when the input output or event has occurred. Now, what does this mean? Well, let's say the data has been read from the disk, from the input, and it's stored in random access memory. Now, as soon as that happens, that is reported and the operating system says to that process control block, oh, I'm going to move you now back from the waiting state to the ready state. And remember the fields were set. But the thing is now we have the process move back to the ready state. Is there anything else that could cause this to move from the waiting to the ready state? Well, yes. When the page fault has been completed, when the swapping has been done and the machine code has been loaded into the memory, we move it back to the ready state. Now, a question we might want to ask is why is the process moved from the waiting state to the ready state? Why is it not moved straight back to the running state? Well, that's because we can't have a situation where the waiting state process moves back to the running state, replacing what's already running there, because what could have been running there could have been a process that had a much higher priority, and we would not want that to actually happen. So what we do, we move it back to the ready state. Now, it's in that queue now. And of course, when does it move to the running state? Well, it depends upon the policies for that particular queue. So when it's in the ready state, it's in the ready state. 
and it now is treated in the same way as all of the other processes that are in the queue in the ready state. Of course what we can now do we can see the final diagram here and what this diagram is showing us are all of the states that a process can be in. We start off in the whole state with the job being admitted to the ready state. The process is then dispatched to the running state. When in the running state a number of things can happen, well three things can happen. It can be released to the finished state. It can have an IO or event wait which moves it to the waiting state or it can be preempted in which case it's moved to the ready state. When in the waiting state, well, it can be moved back to the ready state, not the running state, remember. And when in the ready state, from the waiting state, it's added to the queue, and then that process is treated like all the other processes that are ready to run. And they will be dispatched as and when, according to the operating system policies. Now, if we look at this diagram, there's a number of things I want to consider. And it's this. The admitting and the releasing is controlled by something referred to as the job scheduler. Now, here I've produced a dotted line, and inside the dotted line, you have got everything being controlled by the process scheduler. So, for example, moving from the running state to the waiting state, being preempted from the running state to the ready state, and the waiting state to the ready state and dispatching from the ready state to the running state, all of this is controlled by the process scheduler. Now let's have a look at something referred to as the process manager. Now we've already really seen what the process manager does, because what we have, the process manager has two levels of responsibility. It has the job scheduler, which we've already discussed. This is the first stage of the allocating of jobs is handled by the job scheduler. It's regarded as being the high-level part of the process manager and it accepts or rejects incoming jobs. We also have the process scheduler, which we've also seen. And this is a second stage and it's handled by the process scheduler and it's regarded as the low-level part of the process manager. And it is responsible for deciding which process gets the CPU and for how long. So when we talk about the job scheduler and the process scheduler, we have to realise they're subparts of the overall process manager. When we look at this diagram here, we have to realize that the movement between all of the states is controlled by the process manager. As we look at the dotted line, we have to realize that everything inside the dotted line is controlled by the process scheduler. Outside of the dotted line is controlled by the job scheduler. But those two subparts together form what's termed the process manager. So when you think about what a process manager does, you have to bring this diagram back into your mind's eye and have a look at what it means when we move between all of the states. Now the thing is, when you see a diagram like this, you're really saying, well, I've got a whole state, a ready state, a running state. But it's normal to see the diagram looking like this, whereby you've got the hold, the ready, the running, the finished, and the waiting. And it's accepted that these are the actual states. So if you're going to be wanting to describe what a process manager does, and you want to describe how processes move from one state to another, and what preempting means and dispatched and so on, you need to be able to produce this diagram in your mind's eye and describe what's going on. Because, of course, this is just a schematic view of what's happening. Of course, we have to write the code, or if you're going to develop an operating system, for all of these particular um, transitions from one state to another. And we've got, as we've seen, process control blocks, describing what the processes are, etc. Now, what I recommend you do is if you can produce this diagram yourself and you want to describe what preempting means or what we have to do when we move from the running to the waiting state and why we move from the running to the waiting state, then you'll have a good idea about the operation of the process manager. Check out the supporting website for these videos and also consider subscribing to the YouTube channel and get an automatic update every time I upload a new video. Also consider subscribing to the Google Plus Circle that relates to these videos.